Hi everybody. Well before we start the recap and the video on this receiver, I just want to show you one more thing. There was one factor that we did not test uh, on the last video. Remember we checked all these capacitors for capacitance and dissipation factor versus frequency. And we talked a little bit about what those meant. We also checked ESR, equivalent series resistance, but what we didn't look at was leakage current or what would be similar to an equivalent parallel resistance to the capacitor. So what happens is if capacitors start to fail, one failure mode is that they will actually begin to be less like capacitors and more like a resistor and that the capacitor will leak. So we're going to take this original old one here, hope you can see it because I have the camera zoomed into this device and I'm going to connect it and I have 16 volts dialed up on this leakage tester and I did a video on building this from a kit um, that I purchased and you can watch that video if you like and the scale that I'm set on is 50 microvolts meaning when we're all the way here to 5 you're going to have that would be 50 microvolts of leakage current and you'll see it will it'll peg the meter for a split second and as the capacitor charges it'll come back and don't worry there are diodes to protect it from you know slamming the meter or damaging the meter movement and then what will happen is as the capacitor charges up your leakage current will drop down theoretically to zero as the capacitor charges so here's the bad capacitor that we pulled out of this receiver and by the way I didn't plan it that way I honestly thought these caps were okay especially when we did the quick ESR test and notice how it proved me wrong when we pulled this pulled that cap out and checked it. I haven't checked any other ones yet but it makes me wonder you know. <laughs> Change in my mind about uh, recapping these older receivers even if they seem to work okay. But that's another subject. Alright let's turn this on and you can see the leakage is getting worse instead of better. Look at that. So this cap is leaky. It is bad that is about 15 right there's about 15 uh, microamps of current of leakage current and while that's not a ton for that type of capacitor at that low of a voltage that's really 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 bad so let's turn this off and let's connect uh, a known good capacitor uh, let's just use one of these UKTs because um, like I said I like these capacitors these Nichicon KT series they're 105 C rated they have very good specs as you saw from that chart from the previous video let's see what it looks like when we turn it on or when we connect it to the leakage meter here we go and see how fast it charges and then right away it drops down below one microamp of of uh, leakage and that's what it should do that's what a good electrolytic capacitor should do okay and they all pretty much do this I mean even that I know you're all going to ask about that other one the uh, the BT series I got a lot of comments on these and yeah they're not real common you don't see these around a lot they're kind of expensive and uh, you don't see them for sale very often but honestly we're not we don't really want these capacitors in this in this position in the amp and we'll talk about that as we do the recap and you can see same thing very low leakage they all go down below one microamp and that's a good capacitor all right I know I mentioned previously about those orange capacitors that are used in the audio sections of the Pioneer and Marantz and a lot of other amplifiers of that era, you know, of the 1970s and so forth. And here is a old one. This is a this is one that was pulled from a unit that was recapped. And I'll try to put it here on a background so you can see it. And this one is 4.7 at 25 and you can see the symbol is that isn't that symbol uh, Nippon Chemicon I think is what that is 
and you notice how they have the shiny epoxied bottom they're sealed these are called low leakage capacitors and it's very hard to measure leakage current on a low leakage capacitor because even a standard good quality capacitor with low ESR and low you know good quality uh, will read very very low leakage okay but these ones are even more so and they're also low noise and they're very high quality and they're no longer made now the Elna's are considered a suitable replacement for that but another one that has a very similar spec and I'll show these to you is the Nichicon KL series or UKL and these are these capacitors right here and they're very nice because they're only an 85C capacitor which is fine but they have the same characteristics as these they're actually listed as a low leakage capacitor and, and they work very well in place of these now why you might ask would we use why are we worried about all this and also why shouldn't we just use film capacitors like this in everything well what I will say about that is in place of these in an audio path thing where it's low voltage low current uh, if you want to use a film capacitor it will work it will uh, it will not have the same roll off at high frequencies as an electrolytic will and I think sometimes they design it like that on purpose um, I have a uh, Pioneer what is it uh, SA9100 amplifier I did a couple videos on those one of them was called the old married couple uh, where it had the tuner and the amp together and I did a restoration for someone on it and they used from the factory film capacitors and I was shocked how just how crystal clear and what kind of sparkling high frequencies uh, response that those amps had they just had a really nice sound but a lot of the amps that have that mellow warm sound that you're talking about that you that we talk about a lot use these electrolytics and I think that gives you as you saw from the charts from previous video that uh, you get a roll off at the higher frequencies the other thing that that does is that will also help curb the tendency for a circuit to oscillate at high frequencies and so you have to kind of watch when you're using these so any and all of the caps that you is that you see here would be a suitable replacement for this they will work just fine either the fine gold FG these are supposed to if you read Nichicon's specs on them they're supposed to have uh, mechanical damping in them as well so you know they're they're supposed to be a low noise capacitor these are audio grade and you saw with the dissipation factor and so forth versus frequency how well they performed so these are good and then of course the KLs which are uh, considered a low leakage capacitor and low noise and then of course the Elna Silmix so any of these will work and I know people say you know this one's junk and that one's honestly you're not going to hear it with your ears <laughs> at least I don't um, maybe there's somebody that can but they all work the same um, you just have to remember there's some capacitors out there that are designed for power supply linear power supply filtering and they will not have the same kind of dissipation factors and so forth at higher frequencies uh, that these types of capacitors do so keep that in mind okay one final word on some of these Chinese capacitors the cheaper ones just because they're cheap Chinese caps doesn't mean they're necessarily bad capacitors um, they can perform very well the only thing is that you don't have a guarantee that they are what they claim to be so you really if you're gonna buy a batch of them you want to test a few of them make sure that they are what they say they are the other thing that we're not sure about is what kind of chemistry they used in them and how long they'll last that's another thing so they may be very very cheap and reasonable 
but and they may even work fine at first but that doesn't guarantee that they're gonna they're gonna last one thing when you buy a reputable name brand capacitor from a reputable name brand factory you know or a supplier such as mauser and digikey and you know all the you know allied electronics and you just go down the list you know uh, you know that you're probably going to get a quality product and if not they will stand behind it you can always send them back and you know they're they're pretty good with that with these things you buy them on ebay you buy them cheap you don't really know uh, what you're getting and, and how long it's going to last even though it's good so if, if it's something you're just hacking together on your bench to test something these are fine but i don't know that i would use these you know in these stereos i just wouldn't although this one's even rated at 105 c you see it come on and focus see it so who knows anyway let's start recapping all right, so here is the strategy that we're going to use uh, to recap this receiver. Anything that you see like this, where you have a capacitor that's directly in the audio path line like this, okay? Any electrolytic like that, we are going to, you know, like in the tone control, most of the tone control ones are gonna be film capacitors or ceramic, we won't have to deal with those. But like these coupling capacitors here, any of those, this one here, these ones, we're going to use uh, ones that, that checked out really good. You know, like the, the either the KT series by Nichicon, the FG, the Fine Golds, or the uh, Silmix, the Elmas. And uh, we're going to stick with those. Now, anything that's in the power supply section or that is just like a bypass capacitor for instance sometimes where the where the uh, power supply comes into the board there'll be a capacitor going to ground I don't see one in here but I'm sure there probably is one somewhere in here if we look closely enough I'm not looking very close right now but uh, let's see if there's one in here someplace an example I could show you but any of those, we will use either a Nichicon PW series, which are 105 degree cap. They're designed for power supplies and things. They're very good, very durable. Or we can use the KTs in those as well. Um, the KTs are all, also 105 degree caps. So that's what we're going to stick with with those. Um, as we go along, I'll show them to you. And... Uh, we'll see how it turns out okay I just want to do a frequency analysis on this before we change any capacitors or any components in this thing at all so I have the amp turned on I have it connected to the uh, the MDO and let's start this I just want to see what our frequency uh, tracking looks like right now Everything's set to flat, by the way, all the controls and everything. And you can see the blue line is the amplitude, you know, the, of the uh, signal versus frequency. And the red line is your phase uh, difference, which we're not worried about that. But you can see, well, right at about two kilohertz it starts to drop off pretty substantially and you can see your treble is down way down like 10 db down <laughs> at 20 kilohertz and there that could be because of our capacitors so we're going to do this same test after we recap the receiver all right so i've picked out the uh, capacitors to redo this board here and if you look down there and yes they are different brands but they all meet the spec of the original that's all that matters really it doesn't really matter that you saw in the test that they're all within the spec of what we need and that's what we're going to use because this is what I have I'm not going to put a special order in if I were going to put a special order in then I could get all of one type or whatever but anyway 
we're working right now on the these 47 microfarad 16 volt I know a lot of you like to watch this so we'll go ahead and do it if you don't like watching soldering and desoldering and things let's skip ahead that's what the beauty of, of uh, YouTube is that you can skip ahead it's not like watching old-fashioned television some of you get so uptight over that I don't like this part well skip it <laughs> that's the way to do it um, life is too short to get worked up over stupid things especially for a video that you're watching by your own choice you're not being forced to watch uh, I tell you life is short before you know it your kids are grown up and uh, just life passes you by you know so let's see here this is Where's the other 47? There it is right there. So all we're going to do is use the, the gun on this one. And again, you've seen me use all the different techniques. And uh, boy, this camera is right in my way. OK. So we'll pull this one out. And I'm not going to check them all, because I don't really care. <laughs> we did, we, we beat that horse to death. Uh, we beat the dead horse on that one in the previous video, so we don't need to do that anymore. We know that we're replacing these, and even and some of them will test good, some of them will not test good. But you know, if some of them are not testing good, how far is it before the other ones don't test good as well? So it's really kind of a moot point, isn't it? Uh, whether they're good or bad. All right, Let's see if I can hold all this while I reach around the camera. There we go. And I'm doing kind of a messy job here, but that looks good. All right. Uh, 47 at 6.3. Again, I don't have the exact voltages on all of these, but just remember, don't go putting ones that are way higher voltage. You know, if these are if these are rated at 6.3 or 10 volts, you know, try to stick with like a 16 volt capacitor or something if that's the smallest you have. Don't put something that's 50 or 100 volts in there because the capacitor is going to have a hard time staying formed. Uh, they're chemically designed. That's why there are different voltage ratings of capacitors in the same values. Uh, if you could just use a, you know, they're all almost the same size anymore. So really it's not about size anymore, but it, it you do want to keep the voltages similar. Uh, because that voltage that's applied to it when it's under use keeps the chemicals in the capacitor properly formed. I know people laugh at that that don't understand how these caps work. But uh, you probably should do a little more research on it before you laugh about it because there is merit to that. And if you work on any other kind of circuitry, not just stereos and things, you'll really see it, how it can make a difference. These are 100 microfarads. And what do I need? 47. Let's see, here's a 47 at 10. That's what I want. I knew I got them. So we're just going to use this Elna because I had them. These are 47 microfarads at 10 volts instead of 6.3, so that'll work just fine. So let's pop this in. All right. Okay. Ultimately, it'd be better just to hold this in something, but, you know, I'm kind of used to working this way. So, that's all there is to it. And what we're going to do is we're going to recap the tone control board. And after we do that, we are going to do that same frequency analysis test and see if it makes any difference. 
Now again, there's a lot of other capacitors that are in the audio path in the amplifier section and so forth. But I think the biggest effect is going to be on this board here. Could be wrong though. I've been wrong before. I don't mind being wrong. Uh, what I do mind is not realizing when I'm wrong because then I can't fix my problem. So never be afraid to be wrong. Just understand that when you learn that you're wrong, fix it instead of just trying to rationalize it. I mean, at least that's how I see it. I mean, if you're going to be in the technical field, you're going to have to be that way because really troubleshooting is all about being wrong until you're right. <laughs> when you're troubleshooting something, it means you may not know what's going on at first. And you may even be barking up the wrong tree, as they say. And uh, that's just part of the technical, you know, the troubleshooting process. And if you're going to be in this kind of thing, you got to have the humility to say, well, I'm not sure, uh, but I'm going to find out. The other thing is, it's always good to listen to what your peers have to say, because sometimes they've been there before and you haven't. And uh, if they're willing to offer you that help uh, from their own experience, I would highly recommend taking advantage of that because that's going to push you ahead and just remember to return the favor, you know. Somebody helps you out, you help them out. That's why early on when I decided to start this YouTube channel, however many years ago it was, I really didn't want it to be a business. I still don't. I have a business and you know, I earn my living from that. But I think it's important to be able to share information. Uh, whenever you can. Okay, so this is 100 microfarads at 10 volts. And these are 100 microfarads at 10 volts. I read in a comment on my previous video that uh, one of you had used these uh, KL series, these low noise caps, and was having a lot of problems with quality control on them. Uh, I have not experienced that. Every one of these I've purchased so far have been absolutely perfect. The only thing I could say to that is maybe you got some bad ones, which is possible because I've seen that happen, or they may have been sitting on the shelf a long time and they needed to be for reformed. And yeah, that's a thing. I, you know, you get capacitors, they may read kind of funny right out of the bin, but if you apply voltage to them, even for a minute or two, and then discharge them and then put them on the tester again, all of a sudden they read perfect. And uh, that's a real thing. Now I don't do that. I don't go and try to form all my capacitors because honestly when you put it in circuit, the circuit applies the voltage and they kind of, they correct themselves. It's not even something, that's why you never see people talk about, hear people talking about that very much or worrying about it because it's really not an issue. Same thing with a power supply. Now what I will say is I did have an issue where I purchased one of those multi-section CAN capacitors from CE and uh, it was a brand new cap and I guess it had been sitting for a long time and instead of bringing, it was on a piece of vacuum tube gear and instead of bringing it up uh, slowly on a Variac, I just, you know, brand new cap, why worry about it? I slammed the power to it and it blew the fuse and all kinds of stuff. And here, all it was was the cap needed to be reformed. And uh, after bringing it up on, uh, slowly on a dim bulb, the cap formed back up. It's been perfect ever since. It was actually, you could see where that happened. I actually have that on a video. If you look at my video on the Fisher X101C that I did the restoration on, uh, that's, the play, that's the video where that happened. And uh, so it, it does happen from time to time. And uh, these tiny capacitors here have so many resistors and things around them that that's not going to cause a problem. You can just go ahead and turn, turn the amp on. It'll work just fine. And if there's any anomalies in the capacitor, uh, as long as the chemistry hasn't failed from age, 
which that happens too. If you get a really, really old capacitor, new old stock that's you know 50 years old, uh, don't be surprised if it won't form up and it will have problems. But the average ones you buy, you know, in the last 20 years, let's say, you won't have those problems. So that's my answer to that. Although I'm interested in knowing more about the, these KL series because they have been fantastic whenever I've used them. And they've been probably one of the best substitutes for those low leakage caps, especially those orange ones I showed you earlier in the video. They've worked really well, and that's why I, I do keep some inventory of them because of that. Although the KT series are surprisingly good, and uh, I don't notice a whole lot of difference using them, but of course, you know, again, it gets into more of how you listen to your gear and what kind of speakers you have and so forth. Okay, there's some crust on this one. I think this one might have been starting to go, but who knows? I don't see any corrosion, but uh, so this one is 100 at 16. I think that's what this is here, right? 100 at 16. So this one's a KT series. And again, like I said, I picked this because this is what I had. And see how far apart the lead spacing is on those? If they're not real far apart, you can just kind of just stick them down in there. But if it gets real wide like that, you don't want to put a lot of force on this. So what I do is I take a pair of pliers. Just bend them down this way. Okay, and then I just make the leads a little bit wider so that they fit properly. Like that. And that just doesn't that keeps from putting force on that on that seal down there. I don't know if that helps it to not leak or not, but I can tell you it puts less stress on the leads and it makes them fit a lot better in there. So again, you don't have to do that all the time but if the leads are real wide I like to do it. The other thing if you notice I cut these off before I solder them. It's really not a huge deal but that's kind of my habit from working with transistors and things. Uh, the leads on these are tin plated and when you cut the lead off it exposes the copper of the lead on the very end and that allows an ingress for corrosion to leach itself in. That's why the, these leads are tinned in the first place is to prevent the corrosion of the copper. And if you cut the lead first and then solder it, that solder will actually fill the end of the lead. Again, that's we're splitting hairs on this. Uh, many people don't do that and it quite often doesn't really matter a whole lot, but it's a habit I've gotten into. Uh, some of the stuff I work on at work uh, is, gets in really high temperature environments and uh, you just get situations where if you don't look out for little things like that sometimes you can have uh, you can have some problems so some of those habits carry off into this and a lot of people kind of look at you and look at me and say, well, why do you do that? Well, probably from that, and is it necessary for, for this stereo? Well, maybe not. Maybe. I don't know. Again, I, I like hearing people's comments on these things. What I don't like is when people are belligerent or belittling to others, because that doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help you if, if you're trying to make yourself look better. And it doesn't help any of us, because it you kind of tend to pull back into your shell when somebody is insulting you and you don't really offer your opinion and you really don't listen to the other person's belligerent opinion. So if you're really trying to educate someone or to learn more from that person as to why they're doing it that way, you're better off kind of talking to them nicely. Kindness gets you a long way in this world you'll find that out. And you'll find out that, you know, electrical engineers, you know, we're we're a pretty friendly community most of the time. 
we like to help one another. We're very interested in the science that we perform and the things that we do. And, uh, you know, a little bit of fraternity goes a long way. All right, we got one left here, and what's this one? This one is rated, what, 10 microfarads at 35 volts. I don't know if I have one of those out or not. I may have to go get one out of the bin. If I can get my hand in here around this camera. Let me there, walk away from the camera. Here we go. I keep bumping my shoulder on the, <laughs> on the uh, display of the camera. All right. 10 at 35. What's this one? I got two extra ones here. Those are 100, so no, those aren't it. So I need a 10 at 35. So let's see what I have here in my bins. There's a 10 at 50. I think that's the closest I'm going to have. So we're going to use that. That should be just fine. You can go up one size in voltage. You just don't want to go up real high. Okay, so here's a 10 at 50, and it's a KT series. Again, it'll be just fine. These KTs for audio use seem to be just a good generic replacement for most parts of the amp. That's why I buy them, <clears throat> and they they seem to work really well on non-audio equipment, too. You know, if you're fixing a power supply or something. I, don't, I wouldn't use them in a switch mode power supply, where there's really high frequencies, although they might work. But uh, I went too far with that, didn't I? Talking too much. But uh, I would use capacitors specifically made for switching power supplies like that. Because you have really high ripple current and all kinds of crazy things going on with those. And uh, again, a capacitor is not a capacitor. There's more to it than just how many microfarads and how many volts. I think we saw that in our previous experiment, didn't we? And uh, it's not audio foolery and all that, although we like to insult one another with terms like that. But uh, and there are some things I think that are snake oil or you know urban legend that people proliferate on the internet. But there, everything comes with a seed of truth. So you kind of have to look into it a little deeper than just discrediting something or someone. All right. Okay, here we go. Hi, everybody. See my reflection. All right, let's go. Okay, something's wrong. Hold on. Let me check the speakers. Oh, I have some. The speakers need to be hooked up. Hold on. Okay, now the speaker terminals are connected, and you can see the blue trace up there how it is. Uh, so we have a signal passing. Let's rerun the test. And again, I think this is not going to be that different, but maybe I'll be proven wrong. We'll see. Just remember what the curve looked like before. I'll take a screenshot of this one and of the previous one, and we'll compare them on the screen. Just take me a few extra minutes to edit that when I'm editing this, but... And so far, you can see it's flat. It's about the same. It's when we get to the high frequencies, that's what we're interested in, what's going to happen at 10 kilohertz. We're almost there. And you can see it's still doing the same thing. Eh. Now, if you look, it scaled itself differently. So it's going from, yeah, it's close. It's close. Very close. So I would say that did not make a huge difference, but I would have to go back and look at the previous, uh, the previous sweep to see, you know, really what difference it did make. But there you have it. Okay, I next, I think the next thing we're going to go for here is the power supply. Power supply is an important one. If you're going to recap, I mean, yes. The signal capacitors can affect the sound performance of the amplifier and sometimes can affect things like bias and so forth. 
but really the most important ones are going to be your power supply ones because they're going to be the highest point of failure. They have the highest voltages on them usually, uh, the, the most ripple current, and they're located around components that get hot. Quite often these heat sinks on a lot of amplifiers from this era are not adequate. They get very hot. And if you look, some of these capacitors, like here's one right here, and here's one here, and here, and here. And you can see this power resistor. It's a 5 watt resistor, and there's two capacitors right against it. And heat is the number one killer of capacitors. Uh, that's what dries the chemicals out inside the, the electrolytics and causes them to fail. So it's not surprising that quite often the highest failure point is going to be the capacitors in the power supply. And that can cause hum and it can cause loss of dynamic range and all kinds of things. And if they begin to short, they, it can even damage the power supply or the circuit board or the, anything in there, you know. Even in extreme cases, if the, the main caps here, these big filter caps go, you could actually damage your power transformer. So it's a good investment to replace your power supply caps. Now, this is where you want to use your 105C capacitors whenever possible because obviously those are going to have more resistance to the volt uh, to the temperature and they're going to last longer. So that's what we're going to try to follow through with on this. And we don't really care about, you know, super low dissipation factor or anything like that. Uh, although it could be beneficial to dynamic power and so forth, it's really, these are linear power supplies. You're going to put 120 hertz here in the States and over, uh, you know, across the pond, 100 hertz. So it's not like you, these are being presented to high frequencies. Again, a lot of folks will say, well, it puts you know, because of the high frequencies of the speakers, that'll carry over to your power supply. There's a little bit of argument for that, but uh, not so much. Should be good if we put some nice standard value 105 capacitors. Okay, another little tip. When you remove capacitors, like you can see how tight these four are in here, and I just took these these ones out of here and here. Now you can see, I don't know if you could see it on here, but right there you see the little plus sign. Before you go to remove the capacitor, make sure you take note of where the minus and the plus of the cap is. And if there is silk screening on the board like this, make sure it matches the actual orientation of the capacitor. Uh, I've seen, especially with Sansui gear, I don't know why I see it on them more than others, where this can be backwards. It can be misprinted. I've seen that happen before. Uh, most of the time they're accurate, but don't just rely on that. Now I've seen um, other folks out there that will actually take a picture of this or take a piece of paper and draw it out and mark you know, the, the, the orientation of the cap or uh, take a little paint marker and just mark the direction that the capacitor, like what direction is to the right, you know, and mark every top of every cap, the, the right pointing right side, you know. Whatever it takes for you to be able to not put the capacitor in backwards, just make sure you do that. There is no right or wrong way. Whatever it is that'll keep you from making a mistake, that's what you should do. Okay, so I went through my inventory and this is what I came up with. And believe it or not, I could have used these for, for both. It doesn't matter. These, these two capacitors here that I drop on the floor uh, is, this is 100 microfarad at 50 volt. And these ones are 100 microfarad at 63 volts. And they're different manufacturers. So Nippon Chemicon, and I think those are Mitsubishi. I could be wrong. I don't rem I don't memorize all that stuff. And I have a feeling these are all, yeah, these are 85C, and these are probably also 85C. Yeah, they are. Now, what I had in stock, first of all, 
you could easily substitute this with a 63 volt capacitor. It won't matter. Okay. <laughs> um, so what we're using, I had these, so we're just going to use them for, just so you, you can see the different ones out here. So these are, I don't even know, I don't even remember what, these are 125 C caps. And the reason I'm doing that is these ones are butting right up against your rectifiers. And see how they're on a heat sink? Those rectifiers will get really warm when you're driving the amp hard. And these are right against it. So having a little bit higher temp capacitor won't hurt. So I would go with at least 105. This is 125. And these are Nippon Chemicons, GXE series. They're very good capacitors. They're kind of like those automotive grade ones I was showing you earlier, those BT series. Really good caps if you can find them. And then same here, this is the old standby for power supplies. I use them on all linear power supplies. Nichicon PW series. They're really good quality capacitors and the pricing is phenomenal on them. They're very reasonably priced. I've never had any problems with these. So that's what we're going to use. I'm going to put them in. And yes, I'm talking a lot, but so many of you comment so much and ask so many questions. If you're not interested in this stuff, skip ahead. Let's put them in and we'll see what they look like. And there they are. And you can see there's a lot more space in there because they're so much smaller than the old ones. And even though these are 63 volt and these are 50 volt, you notice they're the same case size and everything. And you'll see that a lot of times. They don't usually, uh, there's, they're just very similar sizes. And you can see right in between here and here, the heat sink of the rectifiers, how much more space there is. So I have a feeling these will last, well, it'll last longer than me. <laughs> so sometimes when you're recapping an amp, you run into these problems. You see there's a capacitor here and here. And if you go around to the back, there is well, there's a metal brace that went all the way across the chassis. And it, this was right in the center of it, so there's no way you could get into it. If I turn you around here, you can see what I had to do is actually I had to move it. So, see, this, is, this was all the way down here. And the capacitors we need to get to are here and here. And this bracket was just right over top of it. So this is kind of where you get into the question of, do you leave that capa those capacitors in there and hope they're OK? Because you know chances are they are. Or do you go through the extra trouble of you know, loosening these screws and these screws and the screws on the board on the other side, and then two more screws here and two more screws here to move this out of the way so you can move it so that you can get to this. I mean, that's going to take you an extra 15 minutes of, of work. If you're charging for a job, this is what you're doing for a living, that's a real valid question. Are, is it worth it to do that? Is your customer willing to pay the extra to have you do that? And if you are going to do that, you need to charge the customer extra for that because it's taking up your bench time. So it's, again, a thought that you have to kind of present to yourself and to your customer. Now if you're doing this for yourself or like I am for a hobby, I don't really care if it takes extra time. You know, all, all I'm doing is taking up time anyway. That's my whole purpose here. So it's not a big deal. But um, if you were looking into this, you know, to doing this uh, for a customer, it's something to consider. I'm going to change it because I have the time to do it and I have no investment in it. Okay, if you look at the corner here, and again, this is the phono stage. So capacitors in here are very critical. You don't, anything you do and you do incorrectly could change the way it works. Now, most uh, of the RIAA curve components, the resistors and capacitors, are either going to be these special mylar film capacitors like this or they're going to be ceramic capacitors, uh, but typically they're not electrolytics. But however, the sound coming in and going out can be through electrolytics, so you want to make sure they're good ones. These orange ones here, 
again, are the low leakage ones. These are the Nippon Chemicon ones. Or no, these are Elmas. And these are the ones we're going to want to replace with uh, the low leakage capacitors. So let me pull those ones out and we'll see what we have to replace that. I'll have to see what value they are. Okay, as you can see, the old caps that were in there were the Elma, and I think they're a type, the type ERB. That C you don't count on there, it's this type ERB. And if you try to look those up on Elma's website or anything, you probably won't find them. Uh, and you probably won't find them on a Google search. You'll probably have to go into the for onto a forum somewhere on an audio website. But they are uh, high-grade audio capacitors, similar to those bright orange ones that have the epoxy on the bottom of them. These aren't like that, but they are. They were Elma's uh, audio-grade capacitor at the time. So we're, we have uh, their 10 microfarad at uh, 25 volt. And whenever you see these, you want to use good quality uh, audio grade caps. And like I said, the KT or the FG series, my Nichicon will work good, or these Elna Silmic 2s, which is what I had in stock. So these will work. So we're going to put these in. Okay, all of the capacitors have been replaced in the phono stage, in the power supply, in the tone control board, and in the amplifier. All been replaced with the appropriate type and value. We've kept the voltages as close to the same as possible. We've kept the capacitance exact and everything else is original stock. So what we're gonna find out now is, is recapping, and there goes the, the camera, is recapping a receiver worth it? Is it going to make that big of a difference? We saw that this had some bad capacitors in it. We measured it, right? Uh, but I'll, I'm going to make a prediction before we do this. I'm going to say it's not going to make as big of a difference as we might think. Why do I say that? Well, the kind of test that I'm doing is using a single frequency, a single sine wave. Now, yes, it varies in frequency over time, but at any given point or moment, there is only one single frequency there. And so we're not listening to musical content, we're listening to a single sinusoidal waveform, or we're, that's what we're looking at on the, on the test system. And the way these amps were designed, <laughs> they're very well designed. The people who made these things knew what they were doing. And I'm not just saying that for Yamaha. I'm talking about all the folks that were making these things. These were built uh, for the very best performance they could get. That's why you saw many different types of capacitors used by the manufacturers. It wasn't just because of cost. It actually, the least of it was because of cost. It was because of the types of capacitors and because of the applications of them and how they, how they all work a little bit differently. And we showed that in the first video. So my prediction is that it's not going to make a huge difference on a single frequency. But listening to it, I think you will hear a little bit clearer sound. Now that's obviously something you're not going to be able to notice playing back through a YouTube, YouTube <laughs> you know, audio, you know, that was recorded on a lapel microphone. But, uh, let's see if this proves me wrong, though. All right, going on to test points one and two, we should have eight millivolts, plus or minus two millivolts, <laughs> without even touching it. Look at that. I'm not even going to touch the pot because it's a one-turn pot. Just the noise of the pot will make it jump that much. Let's go to the other channel. And we have troubles. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Tony, you should have checked that. Are you guys going to chastise me, you know? You sh probably should. You should say, Tony, you should know better than that. So, all right. So we have to adjust this potentiometer here and see if we can bring this down a little bit. Wow. That was quite terrible, I would say. Well, I don't know if that necessary, necessarily caused my bad noise, but I will tell you, definitely uh, 
that's not good for it and I can tell you these are running pretty warm and the transistors down here are just blistering hot wow not right okay so I'm gonna play around with this a little bit there we go I'm not gonna go much beyond that and I think we're just gonna leave sleeping dogs lie uh, first of all I noticed when we turn the volume up see the purple and the orange line Th those are your that's the wattage each graticule is 10 watts so you can see and you can see the traces aren't falling on top of one another and that's because of the balance pot let me rotate the balance pot just ever so slightly I'll bring these together and you can see right there they're on top of one another and you can see the RMS voltage for each channel is perfect now or very close to perfect okay I can just go ever so slightly right there okay so they're both falling on top of one another but if you take a look our balance control is quite a bit off you see the little notch right there it's almost one whole click off and if I rotate the volume up and down it tracks pretty closely but not perfectly so the volume control is off by a little bit too you can see they kind of drift apart and as we get up closer it stays so it's not bad but yeah the volume and, and balance pot aren't perfectly balanced that's okay though let's take this all the way up and you can see the clipping starts all the way up above 60 watts and is that truly 60 watts well let's bring it down here we have 22 0.2 volts RMS and if we do the math we'll say uh, we'll just call it 22.2 22.2 squared divided by 8 ohm load 61 watts for a 50 watt amp that's pretty good and if we take this up to its clipping point and just go a little bit below it we'll just let's say we'll run it right around 60 watts there and if we look at our harmonic distortion <laughs> yeah really good and then if we go just start edging up into it you can see it climbs very quickly as soon as I just go to the 61 or 62 watts but as long as I keep it down there look at that look at that THD beautiful okay at 20 Hertz I gotta change the scope a little bit and again I it starts breaking up around right around 60 watts you see the little bit of distortion there bring it down and I'm right around that 50 watt range and we have to turn our balance control that's pretty good that's at 20 Hertz and if we go to 20 kilohertz right and again kind of out of balance again not perfect and part of it is the tone control section probably isn't tracking perfectly either with frequency versus amplitude and again 20 kilohertz very very good for distortion okay everybody so I have everything put together we know the bias is all set properly and everything but I did a preliminary run on this on the setup when I was putting it back together testing it and I think I found uh, where I made a mistake in the original testing of this so if you recall before we recap this I did a frequency analysis and it showed quite a drop off probably of about 10 dB uh, on at, at around 20 kilohertz and it started rolling off like right around 2 kilohertz and that looked kind of strange and I'm like I didn't it, I really believe that I had this set up right 
But if you recall, the, the tone control board was out of the unit. And the way I set it up was by counting the number of clicks on the tone control. So if you look at these tone controls, there's a total of 10 clicks. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So if you go all the way to the end and you rotate 5 clicks, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you'll be at the flat setting. And you remember, I didn't have the faceplate on. The whole board was out. So I set all these to their flat settings by rotating the pot all the way counterclockwise and then clicking up five clicks. I believe that I did that on every single one of the knobs. But what I noticed is when I did the frequency analysis on this, it just didn't seem right <laughs> because when we did the, the frequency analysis in the beginning, in the, at the, the first time without recapping it, remember we had that roll off. And strangely enough, if I have the tone control or the treble control all the way counterclockwise, watch what happens when we do the frequency analysis. All right, let me shut this light off so it's a little easier to see. Now remember, I have the tone control or the uh, treble control all the way to counterclockwise to minus five. And I have the other tone controls flat. And we'll just take a look at this. And I think I have the volume and everything set about the same as it was in the original test. And you can see up here we have 7 dB and here's minus 3 dB. So that would be a 10 dB difference from this line to this line. And that roll off looks suspiciously similar to what we were seeing before we recapped the amplifier. Now turning the treble control to flat, okay, so all I'm doing is I'm taking this here and I'm going to rotate it where it belongs, where I thought it was when I did the, the original test. Now remember, we just we, this amp is all recapped and everything. I run the test again. And we'll just watch what the trace does. flat as a pancake. See that? If anything, it's a little bit up. Not much. Not, not audibly noticeable it wouldn't be, but you can see it's a very flat response curve, as we would expect, uh, you know, in a freshly recapped and freshly biased and adjusted amplifier. So I guess the question is, <laughs> I swear I checked that two or three times and that I had the tone control set properly when I did that original test before I capped it. But out of an abundance of caution and an abundance of honesty, I want you all to know that this is what it looks like. So I can't really say that uh, recapping the amp made it any different because now I'm kind of wondering, was the treble control rotated like that. And the reason I say this is, remember how much roll off we had <laughs> uh, before we recapped the amp. And I just can't believe that just replacing some capacitors would make a 10 dB difference. The other thing I want to show you, let me go get a, let me go get a printout that I just made. Okay, I've printed these two parts out from the owner's manual, not the service manual. And it just shows the uh, the specifications of the receiver. And if you look here, this is the chart of the tone controls and the roll off that they have when you adjust them. Okay, and so you can see when the knobs are turned to minus five and plus five at the treble end and at the bass end. So when we go to minus five on our treble, it's going to give you approximately a minus 12 dB uh, tone cut. See that right there? And if we look in the service or in the uh, spec list, tone controls, 
and it's saying at 50 hertz the bass boost and cut will give you plus or minus 13 dB and the treble boost cut will be plus or minus 10 dB. You see that? Now I think that's kind of suspicious when we do the test if I turn the treble control all the way to minus 5 we do in fact see that minus 10 dB uh, cut and it looks suspiciously similar to the curve we were seeing when I did the first test without recapping the receiver. Okay, So what I'm trying to say is that I don't want to mislead you. Uh, there is a good possibility I did the test incorrectly at the first time and therefore that would indicate that from a frequency analysis standpoint recapping this amp even though the capacitors we tested some of them were actually bad very bad it made very little difference in the frequency response at least with a single sine wave frequency uh, of the amplifier okay and uh, now does that mean that it made no difference at all well no I wouldn't be so bold as to say that because a lot of it has to do in, with the listening you know complex waveforms are a little bit different than a single waveform and I understand about Nyquest and all that stuff you don't have to put that in the in, you know <laughs> in the comments but bottom line this may not have made a big difference in the sound um, or at least in the performance from a test equipment standpoint okay so again I'm trying to be as open with this as possible I may possibly have redone, have done the test wrong, but it, I remember specifically rotating all of these controls five turns clockwise, and I remember turning the loudness all the way to the flat setting. So, I don't know. It just seems like too much of a coincidence. I cannot believe that replacing the capacitors made that massive of a difference. I know I'm prattling on and on, but I, this is what's going on in my mind right now, and I want you to all understand it, uh, what I'm saying. So, long story short, recapping the amp may or may not make much of a difference <laughs> in the performance. Okay, now that we can see right now the right channel, what it looks like after capping it and making sure the tone controls are set to flat, let's do the left channel. And again, I have the volume knob and everything pretty much exactly the same place it was. I just moved the scope from monitoring the right channel to monitoring the left channel. And you can see we pretty much have an almost identical uh, track there. Looks very, very similar. So good, both channels perform the same. Okay, let's queue up our stranger danger. I have all the controls set to flat. you but it sounds pretty good on this end. I think we've achieved success with this amplifier and like I said uh, I apologize about not being sure about this about the uh, the first 
frequency analysis we did before recapping. Uh, well, I think now at least we see what it's like to recap an amp. I hope uh, those of you who were asking about it, uh, I hope I was able to show you what you wanted to see. And I think we'll do one more part on this where we'll actually go over the tuner section. This is a very interesting design for a tuner. Uh, it's a little bit different than just some of the standard analog tuners out there. And you can see there's a lot of integrated circuits. Uh, so that greatly simplifies it and also makes it a lot more accurate. And it should make the alignment fairly simple on this, I say. <laughs> Famous last words. But uh, we'll go over that in the next part. And, uh, but I think that's all we're going to do for this video. And when we go up and get this edited. And as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And we'll see you again real soon. Take care. Bye-bye.